Church of Christ Lectureship. We'll start off this morning with number 811, Jesus in the Morning. 811. <clears throat> Sing all four verses. 811. <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus. We thank you so much for the opportunity we have to gather here this morning today to study more about the church that Jesus gave his life for. We know that Jesus shed his precious blood to establish the kingdom, the church, which would last forever. We pray that we will be attentive today and that we will always strive to make sure that the church that we are following is the one that you want us to, <clears throat> to be members of. We thank you for everyone that is here today. We pray that our hearts and minds will be open to your word. Such a <clears throat> almighty grace that you've shown us the love that Jesus had for us, that he would shed his precious blood for our sins. We ask that we will always be thankful. We will always be together. We will always follow your words 
we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you all here. We're certainly appreciative of you making the time today to be here uh, for our lectureship. We've been looking forward to this for a number of months. Uh, for me personally, I'm excited to have uh, one of my professors from Faulkner University, uh, Dr. Gleaves, is here. Uh, I was really excited about that until a few minutes ago. He came up to me and he said, I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell all of my students, and that's don't embarrass the Bible college. So uh, here we go. Hopefully he doesn't leave here disappointed today. But um, I'm thrilled that you guys have, have made the effort to be here today. We've got a lot on the schedule, a lot of, uh, of tremendous lessons that we're looking forward to uh, as we consider uh, what the church of God's intent looks like. Now, I saw a study recently that says there's something along the lines of 200 different what we would call denominations of Christianity in the United States today, and something like 45,000 globally. Now, that seems to be a little bit of a contradiction in and of itself, because many of those various churches, as they would call themselves, teach things that contradict one another. Some will, will teach baptism is necessary for salvation, as we do in the Lord's Church. Others will say, no, all you have to do is believe, and that's enough. Just believe in Jesus, and, and that's good enough. And to be honest, it can be a little bit confusing, especially for people who are young Christians, who are newer Christians, or for those who have never darkened the doors of a church building before, they might look at Christianity, broadly speaking, and say, this makes no sense to me. How can we have all of these different churches and none of them seem to agree uh, on anything, on the way that things should be done? Now, I don't want to spend today, and I don't think any of our speakers today intend on addressing individual denominations or anything like that, because that's not really where our concern is, is it? I'm not concerned about denominations. I want them to get right. But what I'm concerned with is whether or not we are doing what God wants us to do, whether we are being and whether we are the church that God intends for us. If you looked on our sign uh, out front of the building, the advertisement there is to discover God's church. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. It doesn't matter what Andrew says it doesn't matter what any of our other speakers say if it doesn't line up with what the Bible teaches and what the Bible has shown us that, that God intends for his church to be. Now, I think of my father when I think about the word intention in intent because often my dad will say something to my mom and my mom will go by what he said and then he'll come by, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes later and say, what in the world are you doing that for? And my mom will say, well, that's, I'm doing that because that's what you told me you wanted. And my dad would say, no, that's, that's not what I said. And my mom would say, no, yes, yes, Andrew, isn't that what he said? And I'd be right there and I'd say, yeah, dad, that's what she said. And he would say, well, that's not what I intended. Well, that's true of, of humans. Sometimes what we say is not what we intend. But aren't we blessed that when it comes to God and when it comes to his church, that what he has said about what he wants for his church is what he intends. Second Timothy chapter three, verses 15 and 16 tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly furnished for every good work. God has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us through his word. He's revealed to us what he wants his church to look like, what he expects his church to be, what he intends for his church to be here in this world. Unfortunately, men sometimes, and that's men not just speaking of males, but speaking of mankind in general, sometimes we make a mess out of what God has intended. 
We take what God wants, and whether it be because of our own traditions, whether it be because of our own desires and what, what we like and what feels good and sounds good to us, we focus on that rather than on what God wants us to be. You know, that's not uncommon. We're not the, the first generation in the world to sometimes see what God wants out of us and still get it wrong. You ever done that? You ever had to look back at your life and be like, boy, I made a mess out of that. You're not alone. In fact, there's a pretty prominent apostle who's a little bit notorious for taking what God wants or what God intended and going a little bit too far, getting a little bit off the mark. We think of Peter before the church is established. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asks his disciples, who do men say that I am? And after telling Jesus, you know, some of them say you're, uh, you're Elijah. Some of you say you're, some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Jesus asks the question, well, well who do you say that I am? And, uh, and Peter, thankfully, answers the question incorrectly, doesn't he? He says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And, of course, Jesus responds and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he tells Peter that on, that on the rock of his confession, that Jesus is the Son of God, he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, that his church would be founded upon that. And yet it's not too much longer, just a few verses later, Jesus is saying that he's going to be taken by lawless hands in Jerusalem and he's essentially going to be killed is what he tells his disciples, and, and Peter gets in Jesus' face, and he says, far be it from you, Lord, this will not happen. And Jesus has to look at Peter and say, get behind me, Satan. And Peter's life sort of mimics that the rest of the way through when we, when we encounter him. He does things really well. Sometimes he gets what God intends for him right. Sometimes he gets what God intends for him wrong. We look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, and Paul tells us that he had to rebuke Peter sharply to his face. Why? Because he was refusing to associate with certain people, certain Gentiles, in the face of other Jews who were sitting there having a meal. He was sort of ostracizing a certain group of God's church, and, and Paul had to go up to Peter and tell him, essentially, stop it. Knock it off. The gospel's for all. The Lord's church is for all. But if even an apostle in Peter who, who functions by inspiration in his writings, uh, he, he's able to perform a number of, of healing miracles and various different things that he would have been able to do as an apostle, prophesy, that kind of stuff. And he still has to be told, you've got it wrong. Somewhere along the line, you've gotten a little bit mixed up, Peter. Somewhere along the line, you've gotten away from what God intends for you. And you're doing your own thing. And we need to get back to what God intends for us. The beautiful thing is, is that though we might get things wrong sometimes, we've got a whole host of letters written by Paul. We've got letters written by Peter. We've got letters written by, uh, by James. You've got the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus to where when we get things wrong, if we are like the, the Bereans of Acts chapter 17, if we are those who are more noble because we take the time to search the scriptures daily to make sure the things that are being taught, to make sure the things that we're being told are true, we can get away from not being what God wants us to be and get back on the way to being exactly what God wants us to be. And what God wants us to be is a light that reflects his son. Here at the, the Carolina Men's Fellowship, oh, I guess that's been almost six months ago now, maybe more than that, uh, one of the, the speakers there, a man by the name of Joe Wells, talks about how metal used to be refined in, in ancient times. 
and that a goldsmith or a silversmith, whoever it might be, would take that, that metal and they would heat it up and get it real hot to purify it and melt it down. And then they would work the impurities out of it. They would pour that metal back into a cast and let it cool. And then when they would take that metal out, the, the person who was working that metal would hold it up. And if they couldn't see their reflection in it, do you know what they would do? They'd stick that metal back in the fire. They'd melt it back down, and they would work it so that it, they might, uh, again, try and get those impurities out of you. The Christian life, the church, is no different. God is going to continue to send us through the refining fire, individually as Christians, collectively as his church. He is going to continue to send us through that refining fire, until we are pure enough that after he pours that metal into the cast and it cools and he holds it up, he sees his own reflection. That's what God intends for his church to be in this world today. A reflection of him, a reflection of his righteousness, a reflection of his values. And it does not matter what any preacher says. It matters what his word says. And as we referenced already, aren't we thankful that God has revealed his intention for his church fully through inspiration, through his inspired writers? Isn't it great that we can trust this book to know that when I come to a place of worship, and I sit down, and I sit amongst the brethren, and maybe I spend a week or a month or a year or five years or ten years with them. We can come to know, are we who God intends us to be? Are we the church that when people come to it, they walk in the doors and they are embraced by a loving congregation who is who recognizes that each one of us sins and falls short of the glory of God, who recognizes that each one of us is in need of God's grace, we're in need of the gift of salvation, we're in need of what God has made available to us to cure us of that otherwise incurable disease that is sin. Are we thankful that we can look in this word and find out, are we right or do we need to make corrections? And aren't we blessed that even when we, we get away a little bit from what God intends for us to be, he doesn't immediately cut us off. If you look to the book of Revelation and Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, you find a series of letters to seven churches. How many of them have nothing bad said about them? It's two. Two of them. Two of the five have... Essentially, keep on doing what you're doing. Stick to that. You're doing well, but recognize that there's always the possibility, even though you're doing good now, that there's still work to be done to stay faithful, to stay and continue to be what God intends you to be. The other five, to varying degrees, have become a church that God did not intend for them to be. The church in Ephesus, Christ writes to them and he says, you've lost your first love. The church in Laodicea, he writes to them and he says, you're neither hot nor you're cold, you're lukewarm, you make me sick. I, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. He has negative things to say about five of the seven churches, but he still calls them his church. Even Laodicea, that hot and cold church that disgusts him, he still calls them his own. He still sees them as belonging to him, even though they have things that they need to fix if they want to be right with him. If they wanted to continue to be associating with him and to, be continu to continue to be identified as one of his. If the church in Laodicea can become lukewarm, if the church in Ephesus can lose its first love, don't you think it's possible for us to do the same thing too? Don't you think it's possible for us from time to time to have a need to look at the scripture to make sure we are measuring up with what the chief cornerstone has set for us? That's our intention with our lectureship today. 
Now, it, by no means are we going to be able to cover every aspect uh, of what the Lord's church, what God intends for his church to be. But today we're going to take a look. Our four speakers here today are going to examine what the early church looked like, what the church, after it has been established in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost, how they function. That's not going to give us a complete picture of what the Lord's church is supposed to look like, but it's going to give us a pretty good idea of maybe some areas we might, we might need to address. We all recognize what's happened with COVID. We all recognize what's happened to church attendance since COVID became a thing and since the world was shut down for a year. We recognize that people have gotten out of the habit of, of associating and affiliating and, and going to other churches' events and things like that. We've gotten out of the habit of fellowshipping with one another. We've really gotten into the habit of sort of isolating ourselves and sort of maybe even to the point at times becoming Sunday morning only Christians or Christians who approach worship and approach the church as I have fulfilled my obligation for the week with what God wants me to do. I've gone to worship on Sunday morning, and so that's good enough. That's all that, that God asks of me. I, I've gone, I, Andrew, I've sang songs. I, I listened during the prayer, Brother Andrew. Preacher, I, I, I paid attention when the, the man who was speaking during the Lord's Supper, I listened to what he had to say. I focused my mind as best I could on what I was doing when I partook the Lord's Supper. I listened to that preacher, and I only, listened, I only looked at my watch twice to see if it was time to go eat lunch. I'm doing pretty good, right? Like that's, I, I'm doing well. I've done what God wants me to do, right? Well, I think we'll find when we go through our day and we examine Acts chapter 2 and some other passages in the Bible, you'll find that that's not what God intends for his church. That is part of what God intends for his church, but that is not all that God wants out of his people. It is not enough for his people to simply be those who come together for one hour a week and spend an hour, maybe two hours if you come to Sunday morning Bible class, maybe three hours if you happen to come on Sunday night. We'll add another half hour if you make it on, on Wednesday. You know, we send our, our children, often we send them to public schools. Many are not blessed to be able to, to stay home and teach their children at home. Those who are, I know that's a blessing for you, but not everyone can. And yet, we send our children to 40 hours of public school education day by day, every single week, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. And we know the things that they're being taught in school. We know that there, in many places in public schools, there is a denial of creationism. There is a denial of God. There is a denial of the, the righteous moral standards that the Bible has laid out. Do we really expect to be able to combat 40 hours a week of our children in a public school system that rejects God? Do we expect to be able to combat that with one hour a week of worship? With two hours a week if you come to Bible study? With three and a half if you happen to come to Sunday morning Bible study, Sunday morning worship, Sunday night uh, worship, and, and Wednesday evening Bible study? Do you expect three and a half to four hours a week to be enough to combat that 40 hours of inundation and indoctrination they're getting in the public school system? Do you expect to be able to compete and to stand up against that when you go into a public workplace and you're among many people who not only reject God, but they celebrate the, the, the lack of morality that exists in the world today? Do you expect three and a half to four hours a week 
to be enough to combat the 40-hour work week in a place surrounded with people who are not godly individuals? Is that going to be enough? Do you think that the church of God's intent will hold up under that pressure if we don't do our part? If we think that all that's required of Christians is that few hours a week we might spend together here at the church building? Or do you think that the church that God intends for us to be should be something more than that? This morning, this afternoon, we, again, we've got a number of tremendous speakers who are going to examine uh, the, the conclusion of Acts chapter 2 and to get a look at what the early church looked like, how that early church functioned, what their relationship among one another was, and how they lived, uh, the togetherness that they shared, and the devotion that they had, and the things that they were devoted to. We're so blessed to have you here today. We thank you that you have taken the time out to come discover God's church in its earliest form, and to see how God's people functioned in the world then and see if there might be something that we can learn from them going forward. Our speaker at the 10 o'clock hour is going to be our brother uh, from Kannapolis. Uh, his name's Kirk Sams. If you've not met him, he's up here. I think it's the first time I've ever seen him wearing uh, something other than Tennessee orange. Um, but we're looking forward to hearing him speak. And again, we're so blessed to have you here. We're going to break for a little bit. Uh, until just about 10 o'clock. So you're going to have half an hour to continue to enjoy the refreshments, continue to enjoy the fellowship with one another, and we look forward to really seriously kicking off uh, our lectures here uh, at 10 o'clock. So we'll be dismissed till then at 10 o'clock. Meet back in here in the auditorium uh, where our brother Jacques will lead a song. Uh, we'll have a prayer by Sonny Motes, and then uh, Rob Albright will introduce our speaker for the hour again. You're dismissed. Thank you, guys.